All right, we're in the tabernacle. Yeah, looking at the tabernacle. And we're in a tent, aren't we? So, holy and pure. That's the title of our of the message this morning. Back in chapter 27, we were looking at the uh, altar, brass altar. And here we get to a different altar. This is the altar of incense. Uh, so, Exodus chapter 30, verse 1 says, And thou shalt make, and God again, God is instructing Moses, and up on the mount Moses would be hearing from the Lord, you shall make an altar to burn incense upon, of shittim wood or acacia wood, that shalt thou make it. Verse 2, A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. So about three feet high and just 18 inches uh, square. Smaller than the brass, for sure. The uh, brass altar. Um, verse 2, The horns thereof shall be of the same, that is, the same dimensions. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about it. And two rings, golden rings, shalt thou put, uh, uh, make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it, shalt thou make it. And they shall uh, be for the places for the staves or the poles to bear it, or to carry it. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil, or be, yeah, before the veil that is by the Ark of the Testimony. So the Holy of Holies, this would be kind of just before that veil, um, and before the mercy seat that is over the testimony. Now, I underlined this in my Bible. This is the whole purpose of, of this altar. Verse 6, the very end there, where I will meet with thee. The reason for all of it is it's a meeting place. God desires, even now, that we would meet with Him. Um, and, and then, the same way, verse 7 goes on, Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresses the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it. And perpep a perpetual incense before the people... No, before the Lord. That's so important. And again, um, you'll see that over and over, especially as we get into Leviticus too. It's before the Lord. All of this is done in sight of, so that the Lord is pleased. So before the Lord, um, throughout, all, throughout your generations. Verse 9, you shall offer no strange incense thereon nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offerings, neither shall ye pour drink offerings thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a in a year with the blood of the sin, uh, uh, the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year he, uh, shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. So it's, it's set apart, it's to be different, it's to be everything else that you do, <laughs> this time of meeting with the Lord was to be set apart, was to be different, was to be holy. The atonement. Um, and verse 11 goes on, the Lord continues to speak unto Moses saying, When you take the sum, or number the children of Israel after their number, then shall they... Give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. This they shall give every one that passes among them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. And a shekel is twenty geras, and a, sh and a half shekel shall be uh, the offering of the Lord. So gera is just lets us know that it's a silver. Um, this is a piece of silver. 
everyone that passes among them that are numbered from twenty years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less. Less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shalt appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. So, this would become known later in the New Testament as the temple tax even to the time of Jesus, where Peter, remember, was asked, does your teacher pay taxes? Are you guys kind of exempt from paying taxes? And Peter said, of course Jesus pays taxes. And put his foot quickly in his mouth <laughs> and went to see Jesus. And Jesus, remember, tells Peter to go fishing and open up that mouth of the fish because you opened your mouth, Peter. So now... You're going to find the shekel there, half for each of them, a half a shekel. It was the same as this. This is the beginning, the uh, beginning of that whole temple tax. It would go on um, throughout all generations. It was used for the atone, uh, the uh, service. The end of verse 16, kind of the middle of service verse 16 actually it was used for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation um, and we're going to see actually how daily uh, these things would become costly expensive it was it was quite a bit so verse 17 goes on this is the brass laver now verse 17 the Lord spoke unto Moses saying you shall make uh, a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, and to wash withal. And thou shalt put it be between the tabernacle of the congregation of the and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. It will be for Aaron and his sons. They shall wash their hands and their feet therein. Uh, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, you shall wash, and they shall wash with water, and that they die not. <laughs> or when they come near to the altar to minister, uh, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet, and they, that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. Um, the the brass laver would be, be uh, significant, especially when it comes to us as believers. Um, we're going to see how washing the water becomes a, uh, a symbol, if you will, of the Word of God. When we're reading the Word, what's happening is we're washing. We get washed by the water of the Word. Um, and the other thing that's interesting to note about the laver is there are no dimensions given. You don't know how big it was. This laver is, is the dimensions are left out. How big... Now when you get to the temple, there's this big, gigantic laver that you do, you're given these dimensions. But it's interesting, originally here, these, this brass laver, which was used for washing, no dimensions are given. Why do I bring that up? Because the Word of God is endless. It, it goes on and on and on. You can never exhaust it. There are no dimensions, if you will. You cannot go long enough in it. The sermon will not be long enough today. It might be too short, but it's not going to ever be too long. And it's the Word of God. Do you, do you realize? You can read John 3.16. We all... Here, John 3.16. You can read that over and over and over again, and there is no, well, once the 50th time that you've read it, it's just not really effective anymore. The measurements are complete. No, this book is so different than any other book, isn't it? 
There are no dimensions. I, I found that really fascinating when it comes to the typology and how, how really we cannot exhaust the Word of God. We can read it and read it. It never gets old. It never gets tiring. Verse 22, Moreover now the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, You shall also take unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250, it does the math, math for you, half as much, 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, and of uh, uh, the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil, and hen, which is a measurement, again, Quite a bit here. And thou shalt make it an, an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. You all know those guys. They're, they're heavy into the perfume. It shall be an holy anointing oil, and thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all his vessels, and the candlestick, and his vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offerings, with all his vessels, and the laver, and his foot, and thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy. Now, whatsoever touches them shall be holy. And thou shalt make, uh, or, sorry, thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them that they may minister unto the people. Oh, no. Excuse me. That they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Verse 31. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be an holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall ye make it, uh, any other like it, after the composition of it, it is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compounds anything like it, or whoever puts any of, of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. Pretty serious stuff, right? And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee spi sweet spices, uh, stakti and onyxcha and... Galbana, I have all that in my kitchen. Uh, these sweet spices and <laughs> with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be a like weight, um, all measured the same. And thou shalt make it a perfume and uh, a confection after the art of the <coughs> apothecary. Um, tempered together, and here's the title of our message today. Pure and holy and thou shalt beat some of the some of it very small and put it put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where again i will meet with thee it shall be unto you most holy and as for the perfume which thou shalt make ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof it shall be unto the holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make it, uh, make like unto, the, to unto that, to smell it, shall even be cut off from his people. So again, we have back to the tabernacle of meeting, how that we have this uh, uh, altar. Now, I had mentioned and opened up talking about in chapter 27 of Exodus, we had this brass altar the first time we were kind of introduced to it. Um, the, the bronze altar. Uh, this altar was to be made of wood. That altar was to be made of bronze. Now, bronze or brass is always... This a uh, uh, picture or s signified um, in the scriptures of judgment. The brass is always the metal 
that reminds us of God's judgment. And the first altar back in first and uh, chapter 27 speaks of Jesus at his first coming when he was judged on the cross when he was uh, bruised and judged and all of the judgment of mankind of the sin of every one of us was put upon him and the wrath of God was satisfied as it was laid upon him for every sin as we just sang, on Him was laid. It's there in the death of Christ that any of us have any life, and especially when it comes to eternal life. So what does this altar speak of? It's much smaller. It's not as big in dimensions. Animals would be on, uh, laid on that brass altar back in chapter 27, and that's where the animals were slaughtered. But here with this incense altar, what it speaks of is what Jesus is presently doing. In fact, what Jesus was doing even when He came um, in uh, Luke's Gospel, in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 32, Luke 22, verse 32, we're reminded of Jesus. Actually, Luke 22, verse 31, the Lord said to Peter, Simon, Simon Peter, Behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But, verse 32 of Luke 22, this is Jesus. But, Peter, I have, what? Prayed for you. Wouldn't that be cool? To be Peter? And just know and hear that Jesus is praying for me. That Satan would not sift I, I would say, I need that too, Lord. I need that, that you pray for me too. Good news, because the author of Hebrews, chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, lets you and I know very clearly, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God unto God by Him, seeing that Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. That's Hebrews 7.25. And that is what Jesus is presently doing at this time, right now, as we're nodding off, almost falling asleep. He is praying and interceding on your behalf. All that word interceding means is really just coming unto somebody on someone else's behalf. That's what Jesus is doing at the right hand of the Father right now. And in fact, in all of Scripture, incense, this altar of incense, is, a, is really a, a great illustration. It's, you could say incense equals prayer. In fact, Psalm 141, Psalm, Psalm chapter 141 there's a lot of chapters in Psalm. <laughs> but cha chapter 141 in verse 2. David it makes this very clear. Uh, in Psalm 141 verse 2, he says, Let my prayer be set forth before you as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. The incense being offered up to the Lord. It's sweet to Him. In fact, Revelation chapter 5, I love this one. In Revelation 5, there when John, is the writer of the book of Revelation, is brought up into heaven. Remember, John gets caught up into heaven and gets a sneak peek at things to come. In, uh, in Revelation 5, verse 8. Revelation 5, 8. He says, uh, he had taken the book and the four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, the lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials of incense, odors, precious, and those were the prayers of the saints. Revelation 5, 8 declares what those odors, what those, that incense means. Prayer. 
It's prayer. That's what it's about. The horns that are mentioned back at Exodus 30, at the beginning of the chapter, we, we read of the, the uh, acacia wood, the, the measurements thereof, very pretty small, like a little three foot high box um, that this thing was to be. The, and all it was meant for was, was burning the incense, right? That's all that, that uh, it was meant for, but... Um, the horns at the end of verse 2. The horns that, that shall be. When you read about horns in Scripture, the horn is always significant of strength and of power and of might. What were the horns used for? Most of the time, it was if an animal was tied to the, the sacrifice, the horns were strong enough to keep that animal tied down for the sacrifice. But in this case, it speaks of, and there's a great picture here, of the power, the strength that we have in what? Prayer. See, we forget the most powerful weapon we have is prayer. And it's the thing we don't do enough of. We talk to other people about God. We might even complain. But bring your prayers before the Lord and He thinks, He knows that it smells sweet in His sight. Pleasing to the Lord. Kind of like the burnt sacrifice. The Lord's a lot like me. I like the smell of a good barbecue. And the Lord loved the aroma being offered up. Whether it was the, the, uh, the goat or this. The incense. All of it was to be sweet. It was all a sweet smell, a sweet aroma. Also notice the crown. Again, the translations, I don't like that they have in their molding, I think it says instead of crown, around the where the incense was kept. The crown reminds us of His second coming. He's not going to have a crown of thorns. It's going to be a crown of what? Does it say in verse 3 at the end? A crown of gold. Speaking of His royalty, of His incredible majesty, and what that crown, that thing molding around about the incense altar was meant for was to keep the incense from falling off. What a, again, what an incredible picture of Jesus Christ. Keeping our prayers from falling over. And more specifically, keeping me from falling over asleep as I try to pray in the morning. <laughs> Jesus is the one that keeps those things from falling, just like that crown on that altar was keeping the prayers, that were, or the incense rather, that were offered from falling off and burning down the whole tent, right? So, every morning and every evening, these, off, these uh, in fact, verse 8 Verse 8 lets us know that he was lighting the uh, lampstands, um, doing these perpetual. That is, it, was, it kept on going. Why? Why do you suppose that is? Because sin doesn't stop. I might do great for a day, but how are you doing? And, and we may all do great for a week, but then how are they doing? Over there in other states, other countries, other... You know, sin is rampant. It's all around us. And so these offerings, these al the altar of incense speaks again of the need for prayer. I love, I love that old gospel tune. It's me. It's me. It's me, O oh Lord. I'm in the need of prayer. And it goes on to say, not my brother, not my sister, not my mother, not my father. It's me. Because too often we think, Oh, they need to hear this. Oh, if they could get here to hear the message. Oh, they need to pray. No, it's me standing in the need of prayer. I'm in need of prayer. Am I the only one? <laughs> it's okay if I am. Also note this very carefully in verse 9. Back at verse 9. God declares it. No strange incense. No strange smelling crud. 
you might jot down Leviticus chapter 10. Because we're going to get more insight on what this means. Strange incense, strange fire as it's called in Leviticus 10. God takes this deadly seriously. Two men who were Aaron, the high priest's son, die because they decided to just bring this, this worldly stuff into the altar and into the presence of God. It happens in too many churches. Bringing in the worldly garbage and thinking that God's going to be pleased or God's okay with that kind of stuff. Just playing Led Zeppelin songs. Playing just stuff that's totally worldly. Totally of the world. And thinking God can accept this. Listen, have no strange incense thereon, nor meat. Again, the sacrifice that we offer is to be, note this, on His terms. His ingredients. His way, not mine. And I had to write this down because it convicted me. Do I come? Do you come to Bible study? Do you come to fellowship? Do you come to prayer? Do you come to communion on your own terms? That is to say, when it's convenient for you, when I'm able to make it, watch out for this attitude. It went on back then, and it goes on today. Or do I understand God knows what's best for my life and for me. I'm going to lay down my rights. I lay me down as we sang earlier. I'm not my own. I used to have my own life. I used to be able to do what I wanted to do. I can't do that anymore if I belong to Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people straddle the fence. And it's a miserable life. You have just enough of Jesus to be miserable in the world, and you have just enough of the world to be miserable at church. Don't stay there if that's you. Make the decision. That was me for a long, long time. Decide. And the old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I know that none may go with me. Still, I will follow. He, knowing that He knows what's best. He knows the ingredients needed for these sweet spices, these incredible oils. <laughs> it's His terms, not mine. It's on His terms, not my, my own. Watch out for the Laodicean <laughs> attitude as, you know, I really don't need much. I could use a little positive lift me up, but I'm doing okay. I'm wretched. I'm naked. I'm blind. I need to come. The things that I do at work, it's for nothing if I'm not engaged as you would go into battle, we should be showing up for church in that same seriousness. Oh, we need Eli to come back and give us a lesson on that. We need to be showing up for church with that same engagement, that same drive. Because this is life, eternal life. Right now in the world, we're not promised any of it. We could be dead and gone and the next few hours. We don't know. None of us know. Book of James says our life is but a vapor. Right? It's but for a moment. And again, the atonement offering that's uh, brought up in verses 11 through 16 there. It's really, it, it reminds us again of tithing. You know that the tithe is, is not a suggestion. 
even if you're not under the law, the tithe in scriptures precedes the law. It was before Moses and any of this came. It was when Abraham met a man named Melchizedek in the book of Genesis, way, way back. It was just something he did. He understood that this belongs to you. In fact, Malachi, in the book of Malachi, we're told a secret that I don't have the choice as a believer. I don't have the choice to say I'm not going to tithe. If that's me and I just don't tithe, now I'm not talking about tithing to this church. I'm talking about tithing to missionaries. Anything. You give your money, 10% of your income should be going to God's work. Whatever that work may be. Otherwise, in the book of Malachi, it says, You rob me, saith the Lord. I didn't rob God. Yes, you did by not tithing. People wonder why their finances, their, their stuff is in shambles. In fact, in uh, verse 12, there at the end of verse 12, back in Exodus 30 here, it says, um, Have everyone give this... Uh, ransom the money that at the end of verse 12 no plague may come upon them you know that plagues come our way today if we refuse to tithe that is refuse to understand that this is God's I wouldn't have a brain if it weren't for him <laughs> I wouldn't have breath in my lungs I wouldn't have this or that it belongs to him and if you don't tithe, you are robbing from God. When we understand it that way, anything above that tithe then is just giving to the Lord because of thankfulness, because of gratefulness, because of God's goodness. We're just, we're just showing our gratitude. But the tithe is to be, that's just a given. And note the end, a uh, verse, the end of verse sixteen, a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. Now we cannot buy our way into heaven. Some people read this and they start to think that because making atonement for your soul and it involves these shekels and the money. No, that. Uh, in fact, Peter, later in, in the book of Acts, he says, your money perish with you when somebody tried to buy the Holy Spirit, buy the gifts and, and the different things. No, this, that's not the idea. But our children are watching us. And what a blessing it is when I see our children learning that, hey, this is a tithe. This is for the Lord. And they give money unto the Lord. All that is hope, all that I'm hoping is that that heart attitude that I don't do what I do for money. I do what I do what? For the Lord. In fact, somebody gives me money, please get this out of my hands. I'll ruin myself. Give it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. That's the idea again there. And oh, how we need the labor, the washing of the water of the Word. Where we give unto the, or we, we uh, understand, my brain has so much garbage that's been pumped into it. I need to wash. I need to wash. I need to wash. Sunday morning, I need to wash. Sunday evening, I need to wash. Monday morning, I need to wash. Monday evening, I need to wash in God's Word. Again, that water. Before we come in, before we go any further into the tabernacle, that is. You must wash. And again, my wife is really into oils. In fact, we have myrrh, we have frankincense, we have all these different oils and balms and things that they had back then. This is one thing I know for sure. Those oils are not cheap. These are costly oils. Now, in the Scripture, the oil is significant of 
the Holy Spirit. Again, not something we should just throw around. Rather costly, expensive. Some, the way that we would treat, I don't know what to, a wedding ring. We ought to treat the Holy Spirit that way. The way that they treated these oils. Very precious. For a practical sense, they had healing uh, aspects to them. Still do. Things that they can physically heal. But more importantly, we anoint with oil, praying that the Holy Spirit would just come upon someone and heal them. Or fill them. And do whatever God wills. The anointing. The anointing. We could talk all day about the anointing. We throw that word around, but do we understand what the anointing really is? It's where that Aaron and his sons are no longer seen, which is a good thing, coming up soon. <laughs> you don't want Aaron to be seen, but you want them filled with the Holy Spirit. Something fun you might want to do sometime is study Peter in the Gospels. Look at this man Peter in the Gospels. See how he talks. See what he does in, the, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Peter, specifically. And then you get to Acts chapter 2, chapter 1 and chapter 2, and you see a whole different Peter. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit, the oil, the anointing. It, set, it is what sets you apart. No pastor, no priest, no reverend, no human of any kind has the power to anoint you. Understand that. We can pray, and we do. But it's God's Holy Spirit that's going to come upon and fill and make you holy, pure. It's impossible apart from the Holy Spirit. And we get fixated, we get, we do, we put people up on pedestals, we talk about books, we talk about movies, we talk about things. It's all about this oil, the Holy Spirit. How precious it is in the sight of God. This is what would be offering up the incense. You know that we can't pray correctly without the Holy Spirit, the oil of gladness. In fact, there are times I go to the Lord in prayer and I don't know what to say. But I'm thankful for what Paul wrote, how that the Holy Spirit with groanings that cannot be uttered interprets for me. It says, this is what Mike really means, Father. <laughs> See, the Holy Spirit is God Jesus is God, and the Father is God. But we oftentimes treat the Holy Spirit with kind of an, a, uh, I won't say disrespect, but just kind of not putting the work of the Holy Spirit on the same level. But it really should be, it really is. Because we have nothing without the Holy Spirit. Now, He will cause us not to make mention of Him. That's His very nature. That's the Holy Spirit. Which, by the way, the Holy Spirit is a person. Because it tells us that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit is not the force that will awaken one day. No. The Holy Spirit is not some source or power. That's, that's the work of the devil and demonic things. The Holy Spirit is very personal. It's, it is a person. And He's God. Almighty. And so, the, the, if anything, what Exodus 30 teaches us is that it's God's way and that apart from His Holy Spirit, we have nothing. We have no way of coming near. No way of drawing near. No words that we know 
could say now, I think it's important to say in verse 32, verse, uh, chapter 30, verse 32, upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, this anointing. People try to get the anointing to come upon this guy because he's strong and handsome, strapping, young. And God says, I don't see them. In fact, Samuel went, didn't he? Samuel went, the, the, the prophet, Samuel went to anoint the first king of Israel. And, and he thought, surely this guy's it. Let me anoint him. No, I can't pour this out. You cannot pour the anoint this precious anointing oil. The precious Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit will not be poured out on who you want it to be poured out on. Man's flesh it shall not be poured out on. In the work of our flesh, trying to muster up you know, the music starts playing and people's emotions starts going and people raise their hand and they come forward. That's the work of men's flesh in so many cases. And they've gotten good at it, man. They've gotten really good at it. And you have 20 people come down. They're all praying and raising their hands. Do you know that one of those 20 will go on to walk with the Lord? Statistically. Because it's all a work of the flesh and it's there's the anointing. Now God is not willing that any should perish, but He's just not able to pour His anointing out on flesh. And when you dim the lights, when you get the mood just right, that's the flesh that thinks that's going to do anything of any value. It'll tickle you, and it might last five years. But no eternal value, which again, the only eternal value, the only way to have any kind of eternity is the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus found it so important, He said that if I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. He knew, again, God knows best. <laughs> Jesus knows best. I thought I was learning something new today. Nope. <laughs> Jesus knows what's best for me. He knows who I should marry. He knows where I should be working better than I do. He knows where I should be. It's silly for us to take our life, take matters into our own hands. It's natural, we do it all the time, but it doesn't excuse it. So these precious, um, sweet incense that comes, it's precious in the sight of the Lord. In fact, you yourselves are a holy priesthood. You yourselves, that's uh, 1 Peter 2, 9. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it tells you, and it tells me, we are a holy priesthood. I was supposed to start with that. 1 Peter 2, 9. Because it's easy for us to read stuff like this and say, why should I care about this? Why should I care about the altar of incense? About the atonement offering? About this or that? Well, 1 Peter 2, verse 9 lets you know, this is for you. It's not just for Aaron and his sons. It's not just for Moses. But you are a chosen royal priesthood. And so we ought to be familiar with these things. And it's radical. It's fascinating to learn all of this is speaking about prayer. It's speaking about washing in God's Word. The pictures that are seen it's so clear, it's so rad, it's just awesome. It's rad, dude. But it also shall be most holy. Verse 37, or sorry, 36, the end of verse 36. I will meet with, you, with thee 
And it shall be unto you most holy that God will meet with you and meets with me. It should be precious in our sight. Just as we all have been there, I think, in a courtroom. Maybe not all of us. I've been there. And just as the judge comes in, right? You're silent. You're, that's called reverence. That's called respect. You're not whispering to the neighbor next to you. You're not twiddling your thumbs or looking at your phone or fidgeting or this or that. You're not doing any of that. Why? The judge is there. The judge is right there. Do you know that Jesus Christ, the righteous and only judge that matters in reality, the only judge that matters throughout all eternity is here, today, right now. And we so often do not understand what Exodus is talking about, verse 36. Where I will meet with you, the end of verse 36, it should be, and it shall be, and it will be, if it's authentic, most holy. We don't know what holy is. We really don't. Because we're not holy. Jesus told us to be holy. Even as my Father in heaven is holy. He said to be perfect. We know none of us can get there. But it's God's will for us. It's, it's His way is for us to come to Him on His terms and to be holy, to be right before Him. And if you're not there, if you're not ready for it, don't wait. Don't wait. Just as we talked at 1 Corinthians 15 on Thursday night. Yeah, Thursday night we went through 1 Corinthians 15 and talked about how we don't have time because the Lord's coming. And in fact, we don't, we don't know when our time is. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. That's if you are the church. That's if you belong to Christ. And there's an old song that came out of that whole thing. There is no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been, what? Left behind. That's still true today, folks. When Jesus Christ comes and we all vanish, it will be too late. You say, no, but I've read Scripture. I know that I can get my head chopped off and I'll be fine. Listen, if you cannot live for Jesus today, what makes you think you will die for Him in that day? And what a waste, anyways, to try and think that you can escape that way. Father, thank You for Your Word today. How powerful. Truly, Lord, You are the holy, anointed anointed one of, of Israel. You are the holy and anointed one. Lord, apart from you there is no life. Apart from you there is no meaning. And God, we spend all week on things that are meaningless. And I lift up those that are here today that you would speak to their hearts, tug on their hearts, Lord, show them there's not much time left and help them to be quickened, to be woken up by Your Spirit that lives today. And Lord, that You would speak to the hearts, all of our hearts, throughout the rest of the day, convicting us, showing us, Lord, just as Your Word is that great mirror that shows us where we have flaws, where there are defects. The more we read it, the more we come to Your Word, the more it causes us to see those flaws and those defects. But we thank You for Your Spirit that's here this morning, that's alive and ready to receive 
anyone that comes. As your word says, Lord, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We thank you for that promise. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. You guys be sure to come forward for prayer. And uh, don't waste any time. <laughs> you have plenty of time to hang out and pray and fellowship. There's nothing else you have to do today. I know that. Amen? Amen. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know that. <laughs> there should be some bread. No? Yes? No, oh, okay. And there's there might even be a donut hole left. You guys check that out. Yeah, I was like, what the heck?